Well, hello there, biology students. Today, we are going to learn about enzymes. And enzymes are catalysts for chemical reactions in living things. You have some fill-in notes to go along with this, so make sure that you fill those little pieces in. Um, we gotta figure out now, what the heck is a catalyst? All right, but before we do that, enzymes are one of many types of proteins. Um, this isn't in your notes or anything. Um, but just to keep in mind, uh, enzymes have a bunch of different functions. Um, first of all, you have some enzymes uh, in your digestive system that help break down and digest things. We call those metabolic enzymes. Um, you have catabolic enzymes. Those things are going to build, like uh, DNA polymerase, for instance, um, RNA polymerase. And then we've got Things um, for detoxification, catalase, like you worked with in lab on Friday. And um, the catalase uh, is going to help you know, break down intruders and that sort of thing. Um, so that's what the catalase is for there. Um, other types of proteins that you've got in your body. Uh, antibodies are proteins. So um, we talked about antibodies when we were talking about blood typing. Uh, antibodies will help fight infection and all sorts of things. Those are proteins. Um, they also transport things like um, hemoglobin in red blood cells. Uh, there's lots of different types of transport proteins um, that we'll learn about, but that's one of them that transports oxygen. Also, they help with your movement. Uh, actin and myosin are proteins, and those are in all muscle cells. Anytime you move ever, it's the actin and the myosin interacting, uh, and it's all because of their shape. Um, <coughs> they have a function there. Uh, those are proteins. Also, proteins will help uh, regulate different things, like uh, hormones, for instance, um, can regulate different body processes. All proteins, all good times, enzymes are just one type of protein. Next slide here. All right, so <clears throat> enzymes are biological catalysts. Now we really have to figure out what the heck a catalyst is. So catalysts are substances uh, that speed up chemical reactions. You're going to learn a lot more about them in chemistry next year. Um, but what we're looking at here is uh, we're looking at a chemical reaction. All right, this is the energy of the reactants. This is the energy of the products. And in the middle, in order to make a chemical reaction go, you need to add some energy. We call that the activation energy. All right, and when we add energy, right, then the reaction goes. What's cool about catalysts is that you can see this dotted line here. Uh, catalysts actually lower the activation energy. So it's not that they you know, change anything else in the reaction. They just make it so that it takes less energy to actually react. And in this picture, it's about this much less energy right, in order to react. So nothing um, of the reactants or the products is changed. The reaction would eventually happen if it wasn't, if it didn't have a catalyst there. But because there's a catalyst there, the reaction happens quicker because it takes less energy to get it started. All right, so they decrease the activation energy which means they increase reaction rate. Make sure that you fill that part in, in your notes. Moving on. Um, so an enzyme's function really depends on its structure. Really any protein, um, its function depends on its structure. Uh, if it doesn't have that structure, that 3D shape, uh, then it's not going to be functional. So uh, there's a couple different structures that we'll talk about. First, the primary structure. It's just the amino acid sequence, and we're going to learn how this primary structure gets built uh, coming up very soon. Um, the sequence of amino acids determines how the protein will fold uh, because the different amino acids will line up with each other different ways. All right, so here's our primary structure. Um, this is just a regular old amino acid chain, and then after a while, um, you get a secondary structure where the protein will fold on itself um, and it'll make a different shape and that folded protein's shape is actually what's going to um, help it function. All right, so 
the secondary structure is, structure is how it folds, right? Um, then we've got the tertiary structure. That's not just like a little bit of how it folds, but the whole chain, how the whole chain folds. And a quaternary structure is actually putting it together with other proteins to make something um, that's really functional. So really you just have to know that primary structure is the amino acid sequence and we're going to learn how that happens uh, later this week. Uh, and then proteins get folded a whole bunch and then uh, the end result of that folding is that the protein has a specific sequence um, and a specific function. This one looks like hemoglobin and it would be carrying oxygen. All right, so an enzyme structure or shape um, allows only certain reactants to bind to the enzyme. All right, make sure that we're filling in those filling notes. Um, so here's sort of an illustration of that. Uh, this reactant right, is only going to bind right here on the enzyme, and this one over here is only going to bind to the other side. You can tell because they've got different shapes there. All right, the substrates are the reactants. So now when I say substrate, I mean reactant. And the active site is this thing here. All right, the active site is where on the enzyme these substrates attach. All right, so we've got the substrates here. Those are also called the reactants. All right, and then the enzyme, the active site on the enzyme is where the substrates attach. So the lock and key model helps illustrate how enzymes function. So let's take a look at this. You actually do have to draw this. So at some point, either right now or at the end of my explanation, make sure that you um, pause the video. You don't have to draw this one because it's already drawn for you, um, but draw the next one and then draw what it looks like in the end. So the lock and key model just kind of tells you, okay, if you have a lock and you have a key, there's only one key that's going to go unlock that lock. All right, it's the same kind of thing uh, here. We've got only one type of substrate is going to bind to each one of these active sites. All right, and so this enzyme is going to be very specific for this reaction. Um, the enzyme will bring the substrates together, all right, and that's how it's going to lower the energy that it takes to react because it's actually going to bring them closer together to begin with. And then uh, the end result is that product where they've now bound together. All right, so if you haven't already, pause, make sure that you get that drawing done. All right, so enzymes are substrate specific. Uh, this is where you're going to have to pause again. Um, and you want to draw probably this one with the circles and the squares. Um, you can draw both if you'd like, but make sure you at least get this one. Um, this shows that enzymes are substrate specific. Is this square one going to bind in this curvy active site? I hope you all yelled no at your computer just then. All right, is this circle one going to bind to this sort of line straight edged active site? I again hope that you all yelled no at your computer. No, it's not. These circle ones are only going to bind to these curvy active sites, and these sort of square rectangle ones are only going to bind to the, the active sites with the straight edges. So all the enzymes, um, they're very specific. They only work with certain substrates. All right, another thing about enzymes is enzymes help a reaction and are not changed by it. I know that you don't have a spot on your notes for drawing this, but it would actually be a very good idea to pause right now and draw this because what you're seeing here is that this enzyme never changes. Right now that these, uh, this product is gone, it's there and ready to get two more reactants to try again. Um, so that's what we've got going on here. Make sure that you get that written down. All right, so enzymes function best in a small range of conditions. Um, make sure that you have that written down. Uh, so let's take a look at this graph over here. Um, let's also get everything written down. So 
Uh, changes in temperature and pH can break hydrogen bonds. Um, the hydrogen bonds are what's going to give that protein its shape. So if we're breaking hydrogen bonds, then it's going to change the shape of an enzyme. And that's not good because then it won't work. Because we just looked at the lock and key model, you need to have the right shape. Uh, when this happens, we say that the enzyme has been denatured and the enzyme no longer functions. Right? So if the enzyme's been denatured, it doesn't have the right shape, it's not going to work very well. So let's take a look. Uh, this picture over here I think is good um, because it shows that uh, this is the optimal temperature for a human enzyme. Right? That's about 37 degrees Celsius and that's the temperature of our own body. So that's good. Hopefully the optimal temperature is the regular temperature of our body. All right. um, in contrast, some bacteria are actually thermophilic. That means they like heat or they're heat tolerant. So their enzymes are going to work at a much higher temperature. Right? What you see here is that this is the reaction rate. So here this is a lower reaction rate. This is a higher reaction rate. And what you notice is after a certain temperature, it drops off rapidly. And that's because if it gets too hot, these hydrogen bonds are going to break which changes the shape of the enzyme. Uh, over here, this is another one, but it's showing pH. All right. Normal pH in the body is about 7.4, um, but pepsin is uh, the enzyme that works in your stomach, and your stomach has a really low pH, so it needs to work at a really low pH. And trypsin works in the intestines, and the intestines are a little bit higher pH, so trypsin needs to work at a little bit higher pH. All right. But any enzyme that's just you know, randomly around in your body is going to want to work at about 7.4 because that's our normal body pH. <laughs> Lols, I can denature proteins. All right, you guys like cats, right? Cat videos. The internet loves these things. That's why I had to put this in here. Um, think of the cat like an acid and think of this yarn like denatured proteins. All right, at first the yarn is all orderly and then the cat gets in there. It's like the little acid protons. All right, and it's going to get in there and it's going to you know, just mess all the yarn up there and so it's going to be one bundled mess. And then you no longer have that shape that you need in the yarn in order to really knit with it properly. Um, it's going to be all over the place. That's kind of the same thing with these proteins, right? These are nice orderly proteins. All right, this is the acid protons, and then this is what it looks like denatured. There's no more, uh, it's totally lost its shape, which means it's lost its function. All right, you've probably seen protein denaturation and you don't even know. Um, anytime you're heating things, like proteins, which you cook a lot of proteins, right? You're gonna not eat raw eggs or raw chicken or raw fish or any of that, you heat it. Um, when you heat it, you denature proteins. Uh, a low or a high pH, basically any pH that's not optimal is going to denature proteins. And again, denaturing just means that you're unfolding the proteins. And the big deal there is a loss of shape is a loss of function. So an example here that you can give is cooking an egg or really cooking anything that's protein, like meat works as well. And you can see here the proteins are all folded up, they're all nice, and then here they're completely unfolded and then they kind of link together and make that color, uh, which is why you see the white there. All right, so now we've gone to the video check-in part of this video. So uh, you need to pause it here, make sure that you can have this question up in front of you. You'll just answer it right below the denaturation protein unfolding. Um, there's a little space at the bottom of your notes. And uh, this is the question, why is it a huge problem? And you usually go to the hospital if you have a very high fever around 40 degrees Celsius. And think about what would happen to your enzymes shape and function at that temperature. If you need to scroll back and take a look at that graph that we were looking at, uh, that would be a good idea. Um, and then pause it here so that you can uh, get the question. When you're done answering the question, you are done with this video. Have a great day and see you later. Bye.